Watch this short video on the screen. Oh, the irony of it. The horror. The flaming end of the caped crusader. Can Bruce possibly escape? For Batman's sake, keep your bat fingers crossed until tomorrow. Same time, same channel. Oh, the cliffhanger. <laughs> Weeks ago when Dustin asked me to fill in the pulpit today, which I'm always honored that I get the chance to do that, and he told me where we would be in Scripture and that he was breaking the story I started thinking, this sounds just like the old-fashioned cliffhanger serial, you know, where that story got doled out to you a little bit at a time, and we had this instrument called the cliffhanger ending to hold your attention. Well, um, I'm Larry Stair, Minister of Discipleship, and I know many of you are expecting a shameless plug for uh, Bible study, how we have a Bible study for every age group. I'm not going to do that this morning. <laughs> However, if you are needing to find a Bible study, I, I even saw one of my teachers raising a hand. They're ready for you. We would love to have you come see me after the service, and we'll be more than happy to help you find a Bible study. Well, last week, Dustin left us with the cliffhanger. So if you weren't here, let me kind of quickly catch you up where we're at in the story. So if you missed last Sunday, shame on you, but we're going to have to go back and recap just a little bit. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been bound hand and foot and tossed into the fiery furnace at the command of one very angry King Neb. We affectionately refer to King Nebuchadnezzar here as King Neb. And so he's the ruler of the Babylonian Empire, and pretty much what he says goes. And shall we say he's a bit on the narcissistic side of life in that he has built this golden statue. And when the horn sounds and the band plays, you're supposed to like, I don't know, drop and, you know, 20 hail uh, nebs or something. I don't know. But why do... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego find themselves in the furnace. Well, they have been ratted out because they cannot and will not worship the gods of Babylon or the golden statue King Neb has made for himself. King Nebuchadnezzar's punishment for our three heroes was to be thrown into the furnace and in a rage, Nebuchadnezzar orders it heated seven times hotter than normal. The three Jewish lads let King Neb know in no uncertain terms that if they perished or if they were rescued by God, they will not worship a false god or Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the furnace plays a key role in this story. Um, while it's not described, historians tell us that the Babylonians had two types of industrial furnaces. One type of furnace was used for smelting ore. They speculate it's probably about this tall, maybe three feet, something like that. It's kind of a circular beehive to which they would smelt their ore. We know that this is a possibility, I guess, because we know a large golden statue has been made. Um, but the second type of industrial furnace was a kiln um, used in the production of bricks. So there's no abundant grade of building stone in the Babylonian Empire. It had to be imported. So it was natural that you would make things out of mud bricks. And so normally they fired mud bricks around about 1,100 degrees. So now you can do the math and you can figure out about how hot King wanted the furnace stoked up to, unless they were firing colored brick, which I didn't realize they made colored brick until I was doing the research, and they fired that at about 1,300 degrees. But here is a picture of a 
what a brick kill might have looked like. We talked about how you get three guys in there. How do you see them walking around? Um, it probably has a larger opening on the side where workers would actually carry the mud bricks in there and they would stoke it. And matter of fact, I've seen one of these in, in El Salvador in the poorer regions up in the mountains where literally it, this thing glows at night. It's so hot from the brick being, being fired. So now you kind of have a picture of what this uh, furnace holds. And now stoke it up seven times hotter. Okay, put some flames coming out of it. That's where we got left off last week. Thank you, Pastor Dustin. All right. So now let's learn some things from this trip. I thought about and I looked for, I will be honest, I looked for the old school flannel graph. Some of you, they won't get that in the next service. <laughs> you know, you cannot buy the old Lifeway four-foot flannel graph that you would have used in large group assembly. That's where I first heard this story was way back when on a flannel graph. And I think in our minds, we put this story away as a story for children. I want to maintain for you today that this is not a story for children, but this is a story instead for the saints of God that is here to encourage us today. Because some of you it's hot where you're at. You're in the furnace. It's coming down on you. What does this story have for us today? How can we apply it to our lives? So first thing I want you to know is that God has the power to flip the script. Okay? Now, I've recapped enough of the story for those who might not have been here last week or tuned in on the stream. Um, but let's now dig into how this story ends and the truths that it has for our lives. Read with me the third chapter of Daniel, verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and said to his advisors, Did we not throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied. I love good yes men in the Bible, don't you? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. You're right, we did. Um, he exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Okay? If you'd ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter, this scene is not what you've expected. After all, three fully dressed, grown guys were tied up and had been tossed into the furnace. If you know the story, it's pretty hot. It's hotter than normal. It's so hot that it kills the best, strongest guards who toss them into the furnace. It's hot. It's an ordeal for these King Nebuchadnezzar is expecting them to just be incinerated. Two things jump out at me from this passage. First is that God has the power and the ability to flip the script. By doing something other than what is expected in any given situation. Surely the fiery furnace is a great backdrop. But maybe you're having trouble relating to this. You know, I, I thought about taking a picture of my furnace, but it's just a gray metal box. It just didn't seem to have the punch that this story had. I know it's hot in there, uh, especially when the electricity didn't work last year. But let me see if I can bring it forward for us. Maybe you know someone that's been diagnosed with cancer or battled that disease and on a follow-up visit has been declared cancer-free. No one can explain that. Have you ever known someone maybe who is dying of a serious illness or disease and they just seem to have this unreal, unnatural peace about them? It's unexplainable. 
That was my dad with bone cancer. Horrible disease. But why was he so calm and so peaceful about it? Maybe that's still too far beyond your, your realm to, to grasp. Maybe a bit more believable is something like someone has made a comment or said something at work. And because you're the known churchgoer, you're the known believer, all heads do that. You've seen it, right? Where the whiplash effect, where all eyes come to you. And now all of a sudden the room is out of air and it's warm and toasty. And you're on the spot. Even in that situation, God has the ability to flip the script. The second thing I want to point out is that when God flips the script, He's present. When God flips the script, He's present. King Neb doesn't exactly get this part right, but he knows that the unexpected has happened and it leaves him searching for an answer. It leaves him searching for an answer. Looking into the furnace, the three are untied, not burnt, unharmed, and are joined by a presence that the king can only attribute to something or someone like a son of the gods. I believe that if you're following along in your scriptures, you closely look at verse 25. Son of gods is a lowercase g. Meaning, it's not God with a big G. We know from you know, some of the discussion that no caps indicate that King Nebuchadnezzar is just attributing this miracle to some God, any old God. Flip the script. He's present. I take comfort in that. I hope you do too. The second thing is, let's go to the next slide, 2 plus 2 equals. Okay, so let's quickly talk about um, the art of storytelling and the art of influence. Okay, how many of you can solve this simple equation, 2 plus 2 equals? A couple of you are a little iffy, but I think we're going to get there. Okay, great. I love when, when people, uh, I love when the younger folks in us know the answer and their hand goes up immediately. Thank you for some of you people that were like leading the adults. A couple of you in the balcony need to move down and get next to some of their grade school kids, okay? All right. It's a simple equation, right? Now let me ask you a more important question. How many of you intelligent, well, okay, pretty intelligent people in this room. Uh, some of you are a little hesitant. Said the answer before we even worked the problem. How many of you jumped the gun and went four? I see some hands, mostly those grade school kids again. Because they're sharp and on the ball. There is something in the human mind, the way that God creates us, that we get a kick out of solving the problem. We get a kick out of solving the problem. It releases some chemicals in our brain. This has been studied, as a matter of fact. If, we, if I just tell you the story and I don't give you some things to try to work together, you're probably not going to remember that story. It's the human mind. It's the way to put something in. The brain is wired to solve problems. We get a rush out of it. We like to arrive at the answer rather than being told. When the story is unfolding, our brain is working to fit all of these things together for the solution. Remember, this is important. In pagan the pagan king's mind, Babylon defeats Judah. Thus, Babylon's gods are more powerful than the gods of Judah. 
That's the script. God's flipped it. Let me show you something in Scripture and not in Scripture this morning. But keep this 2 plus 2 in mind um, as we look at the Scriptures. King Neb is sure of how this little fire scenario is going to play out. But like we said, the script has been flipped. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar approached the door of the furnace of a blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. Now, the fire's roaring. He's yelling. For them to come out. And he's not even close. Because remember, if you get really close, you die. And so he's a ways back yelling at this roaring inferno for these guys to come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And then this, the satraps, the perfects, the governors, and the king's advisors gathered around. And they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of the men. Not a hair of their heads were singed, their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. Have any of you ever been to a, a hot dog roast? What do you smell like when you get home? What does the dirty clothes hamper smell like for the next week? They don't smell of smoke at all. No trace. I love the next part. Um, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels and rescued um, his servant who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Here we sing King Nebuchadnezzar, get it. He's approached the furnace. He's called out the three. And I love this part. After careful examination by the smart guys, it is confirmed that the three are no longer tied up. Their clothes are not burnt. And they do not even smell of smoke. um, And indeed are standing before the king. Yep, it's a miracle. It's been certified But wait, there's a whole lot more going on here. King Nebuchadnezzar works the equation of influence and discovery. In the Christian Standard Bible, in chapter 3, if you were to jump back to last week's sermon, uh, verse 17 says, If the God we serve exists, this is Shadrach and Meshach speaking, then he will rescue us from the furnace of a blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the, from the power of you, the king. But even if he doesn't rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. We saw this last week, and now we want to add verse 25. He exclaimed, look! I see four men not tied up, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of God. He is working two plus two in his mind. So have you worked out the solution? Faithful witness and action plus God's involvement equals godly influence. Say that with me. Faithful witness and action plus God's involvement equals godly influence. When all eyes turn to you at work or at school, remember faithful witness and action plus God's involvement will equal godly influence. What's not here? Anybody pick up on what's not here? God does not appear 
to King Neb at this point. He doesn't walk out of the fiery furnace and go, Hi, King Neb. God, glad to meet you. Or even if it's an angel, the angel doesn't come out and spread his wings and go, Hi, King Neb. I'm an angel messenger of God. Glad to meet you. There's no record of this, of God's angel or God's spirit coming out of the furnace. Rather, the witness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with the presence and involvement of God's influence, are what influenced King Nebuchadnezzar to make his great discovery. Verse 26, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. Come out. He's gone from this, there some old gods in there, or son of some old god, to servants of the Most High God come out. King Nev has been influenced to have a key gain in understanding of the God of our three heroes. Their God is not a God but rather he is the God, the Most High God. King Nebuchadnezzar gets it right. Sometimes I think uh, we wonder if what we do matters in our Christian life. Does our personal faith in God and our daily actions make a difference at all? If I do what God asks and I pray in the morning and get up, is it really going to even make a dime's worth of difference? If I boldly stand in my faith, live or die, would it even matter? Maybe the next few verses will help us. Influence brings change. Not only did King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledge that they served the Most High God in verse 26, but in verse 28 we see him, what? He praises their God as res- who rescued his servants. Not Nebuchadnezzar's servants, God's servants. At, at this point, In Nebuchadnezzar's pagan understanding, he had identified that there was some form of deity in the furnace. Remember, the Babylonians understood um, a lot about gods, um, a lot about gods and gods and plural. And Dustin did a great job explaining that last week. So basically, they're just they were cool. If he would have been okay if it was just any old god. That fit with their understanding. It's about the hierarchy of what God's most important. Nebuchadnezzar has yielded who's the most important here. He has come to a great understanding. But it's God's influence that brings about this change. Verse 28, if we were to look at it, it says, Nebuchadnezzar explained... Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their life rather than worship any god except their own. Right off the bat, we see how God uses the faithful witness and action in his presence to influence King Nebuchadnezzar. But this change also brings about a larger change, a more drastic change than just King Nebuchadnezzar going, that's the God, the Most High God. Look with me in verses 29 and 30. Therefore, I issue a decree that if anyone anyone of any people, nation, or language who say anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They will be torn limb from limb and their house made a garbage dump. Sounds pretty drastic. But we know King Nebuchadnezzar's kind of into the drastic, kind of dramatic stuff. So it fits. 
For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Not only does faithful witness and action plus God's presence equal godly influence, we now see a new equation emerging. Godly influence plus honoring God equals glorification. If you've ever wondered, how do I glorify God? This is something I struggled with early on when I was, a, was a, a kind of new at the Christian faith, especially when I got to college and we started talking about glorifying God, glorifying God. What does it look like to glorify God? Somebody tell me. Man, if I'd have just paid attention to the flannel graph, I would have known. <laughs> Godly influence plus honoring God equals glorification. For those of you that don't like flannel graphs, graphs let me quote Google now. Glorification. The action of describing or representing something that is admirable to Praise and worship of God, the practice of acknowledging and revealing the glory of God by one's actions. At the beginning of the story, Nebuchadnezzar decrees that he's the one that should be worshipped. Now, through the faithful witness and actions of, of the three Jewish lads, Shad and the guys... The king now declares that if you even speak against their God, it's bad news. Not only bad news for you, but bad news for your neighbors. How would you like to live next to the garbage dump? A little pressure on your neighbors to not, not talk bad about the Jewish God. Somebody might rat you out. You know what happened to those guys in the furnace? It's going to be worse for us. Quite the change. Plus, like any cliffhanger, any good cliffhanger, we, we know Batman made it out of the 10,000-degree furnace. We, we know, you know, it's just the way the story plot works. We, we know. Just like this story, we know how it ends, too. But our heroes go from being toasted and roasted to being promoted and honored. That doesn't always work that way. I, it's not a guarantee, but I do find it interesting. So today, what should we take away from this story? Certainly, as Pastor Dustin shared last week, trials and confrontations of some point are coming your way. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. If you live the Christian life, it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Has anybody ever played the little kid's game, whack-a-mole? You know, you're standing there with a big mallet, and as soon as the mole pops its head up, you try to smack it, and if you do, it goes, Wee! and goes back down in the hole. It's worth a quarter sometime just to do it. It's great frustration, relief. If we stick our head up, it's almost like someone's trying to play Christian whack-a-mole. But do we go, Wee! And drop back down the hole, or do we glorify God? Dustin told us it's going to happen. So here's my takeaway list from the end of the story. You may want to add some other things to this, but here's my quick little takeaway list. Nothing is impossible with God. Look it up, Luke 1.37. And with God, all things are possible. Look it up. Matthew 19, 26. These are true statements. If you ever wonder, is it true? We can go to this story and see that it is possible. God can flip the script. It is within his power and authority to do so. Second. Taken captive or rescued from the fire does not define God, but sets the stage for Him to be glorified. Whether I'm rescued from the fire 
or I am set free of a situation, it does not define God. It only sets the stage for him to be glorified. The truth is, he still exists, is all-powerful, and, and is at work. Third, it's God's pattern. It is God's pattern to work through the faithful witness and action of those that believe in and follow him. Be it Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh, the boys in the fiery furnace, or the writer of Hebrews who reminds his readers that the, in Hebrews 11.4 of the past heroes of the faith who did what? Quench the fury of the flames. I wonder where he got that illustration. Not really, I know. God's design, though, is to work through those who faithfully follow Him. What's your job as a Christian? Faithfully follow, glorify, use your influence, grow your influence. Shadrach and Meshach didn't, and Bendigo, I don't want to leave him out. Um, there's something in my Baptist DNA that I have to say all three of those names. They didn't just sit in the fiery furnace. They started walking with God. They weren't bumps on a log saying, oh, woe is me. They walked with the Spirit of God. And finally, and I stole this one. I'll just admit it right up front. I ripped it straight off. Finally, if God can deliver three Hebrews from the furnace, he can see saints of any age through their fiery trials. Stephen R. Miller, the American Commentary. I think the biggest takeaway today as I begin to wrap this up is that this story is not locked in the past on the flannel graph. Forget the past. We should be playing this story out in our daily lives as we bring glory and honor to God by using our Christian influence to change the little things around us that ultimately change the great things around us. As the praise team comes up, let me just issue a word of invitation to you this morning. Maybe today, like King Nebuchadnezzar, you've realized that God really is the God of the Most High. The Most High God, worthy of all, worthy to be worshipped. You're ready to accept Christ as Lord and Savior and, and go all in in faith. Well, I'd love to talk to you in the back this morning if that's where you're at. And we can talk about that even after this service. Just catch me in the hall. Maybe this morning you're, you're looking for a church where you can get all in and identify with fellow believers. And, and well, if that's your case, I'd love to talk to you as well. Maybe as a believer this morning you're just facing a fiery trial. And you just want someone to pray with you and encourage you. I'd love to do that this morning too in the back as well. Bo. Come lead us.